Hi everyone, we are back with chapter 9, um, and we're going to talk about, um, in the next couple chapters, about uh, there's the influence that other people have on us and decision making about, about um, mark making marketing decisions. Well, actually all decisions, but marketing in this instance. Okay, so we're going to talk about a human behavior truth. Uh, people are strongly influenced by what others think and how they behave. So reference groups are groups of people that serve as sources of comparison, influence, and norms for people's opinions, values, and behaviors. We're going to talk about that in more detail. So the most important reference group is the family. Um, we're going to talk about that in the next chapter. But um, it provides people, children, with the skills, knowledge, attitudes, and experiences necessary to function as consumers and in a process called consumer socialization. So again, we're going to talk... We talked about credibility. We've talked about credibility before. We've talked about credibility now. Um, the source's persuasive impact uh, stems from its perceived expertise, trustworthiness, and believability. So how much do you trust that person who's giving you the information? Reference groups have, have, a, have a large source of credibility. Reference groups, don't forget, are people that you, um, are groups that you see yourself as a part of. And what your reference group is can change. You can see it as, you know, parents. You can see it through family. You can see it um, through your classmates, your schoolmates, people you work with, people you play soccer with, um, that kind of thing, or whatever sport you may play. Okay, so there's two types of influences. There's normative influence, um, which is the idea of learning and adapting someone's the group's norms, the values, the behaviors. Um, they, the normative influence comes from people naturally belong, family, peers, other members of your community, your church, your synagogue, your mosque, whatever it may be. Okay, then comparative influence is when people compare themselves to others whom they respect and admire, and they adopt those behaviors, so it's, and they imitate the behavior, so it's the groups that they want to be a part of. Okay, so there's um, membership group and symbolic group. Um, the membership group are people that you're a part of, and then... The symbolic group, um, it's not necessarily part of the, um, they're not, you're not, not really necessarily part of that group, but um, it's a group that you, you, um, you might be unaware of, that's out there, but you might be unaware of. That charts from the book. Okay, so consumption-related reference groups. Um, friendship, friends, shopping groups, virtual communities, um, we talk about advocacy groups. An advocacy group would be um, someone who's you know fighting for certain types of of um, consumer rights or environmental rights. Okay, so what sort of factors um, affect reference group influence? So conformity, the influence its members to influence influence the members. A reference group must inform members that the brand product exists, provide some a way to compare thinking with the attitudes and behaviors of the group. Um, influence the individual to adopt the attitudes and behaviors that are consistent with the group's norms and legitimize the member's decision to use the same products as their other members. So other factors that affect reference group influence are the power and the expertise of the group, um, how much the relevant information is in terms of um, uh, about the product that's out there, and the product conspicuousness, so that is how visible is the product. Um, is, it, is, it, is, you know, is it going to have some sort of influence on the status of the, of the um, product? Or the, is it going to influence what the, the buyer's um, feeling of stature in the group? Okay, so there are, we talked about different types of personality traits that may influence how able someone is to be influenced. So people who are compliant um, tend to conform because they have this high need to affiliate or feel like they're a part of a group. They want to be liked by others. Um, they're more receptive to group influences. And then competitive people desire to con have a desire to control other people, and they're less likely to look for guidance from reference groups. <clears throat> and that changes throughout your life. Um, you know, what, that, that changes throughout your life, essentially. We're going to talk, we'll, we're going to talk more about that when we talk about family. 
so so credibility is basically how believable is the endorse is the is the endorser the spokesperson the person in the ad so you'll see that you know when and celebrities fall out of favor. A Tiger Woods, for example, used to be a great source of credibility, but now that his star has sort of fallen, we, we don't look to him as much. Um, so ex what people look at in terms of um, uh, measuring credibility is expertise, trustworthiness, how attractive they are, and how likable they are. All of these things are very important. We talk about this in organizational behavior. Um, we talk about this in terms of, you know, when we talk about power and influence. So how do you convey company credibility? Past performance. So has the product done well for you in the past? Have you liked those sneakers that you've worn, the Nike sneakers, or do you prefer the Under Armour? What's the reputation, the quality, the amount of service that you have? Again, the image of the, um, the uh, spokesperson. Um, also the reputation of the retailer that, that carries it. So you know, do you have a different feeling about the Nike sneakers that you buy at, say, Target versus the Nike sneakers that you buy at Foot Locker. Um, what media they use and where they advertise. And then um, this whole idea of institutional advertising. Institutional advertising is promoting the institution itself without actually looking at one specific product. We also talked about that previously as umbrella, an umbrella campaign. Okay, so we want to, when we talk about endorsers and spokespersons, um, we want to make sure that there's some sort of synergy or connection between the two. Um, that there's a type of product. So if, let's talk about Tiger Woods. You know, with, is there some sort of connection between Tiger Woods and and women's perfume? No, but there would be, say, someone maybe a, a sports drink or, um, uh, you know, sports equipment, that kind of thing. Um, you want to make sure that the endorser has some sort of uh, similar demographics to the target audience because it makes them more credible. And they have to be able to trust the marketer. Even if they like the endorser, they still have to trust the marketer. So you want to make sure that you have an accurate um, matchup. So, you know, say, you know, the, like the, some of these cooking celebrities, Rachel Ray or something like that, that um, people might like, the, might like her, but they might not necessarily. You have to make sure they actually trust the company that she's selling for. And it also must be um, congruent or in line with the spokesperson's qualification. So make sure that they actually know what they're talking about. That kind of goes back to, you know, you're not going to have a, a, someone, a cooking celebrity, endorse some sort of sports product. Okay, so what are some different ways that you use um, uh, celebrity endorsements? One are testimonials, the idea of personal usage. Um, celebrity, so that's te celebrity testimonial. Celebrity endorsement is um, a peer on behalf of the product, which they may or may not have direct experience or familiarity for extended periods. So that kind of thing. Celebrity actor is the celebrity that plays a part in a commercial for the product. So um, uh, it could they could be playing a role that they might not be in themselves, but they actually are like they're, you know. George Clooney might not be endorsing it as George Clooney. He might be endorsing it as, as, as you know, an, act, an actor playing a role in the ad. And then there's celebrity spokespersons. Um, the celebrity represents the brand or company over an extended period of time. Okay, so we also want to make sure we talk about other, other sources of credibility. We want to make sure the salesperson is credible, the vendor, the store is credible. Um, and that there's some level of credibility to the message um, based on previous experience. And then the, how, how um, credible is the medium? So, you know, for example, uh, you know, during a primetime television program might be more credible than, say, you know, a, a late night infomercial or something like that. Okay, opinion leaders um, using one person who's the opinion leader informally can inf is going to influence other people who might uh, who might be either opinion seekers or recipients and occurs between two or more people, neither of whom is a re represents a commercial seller or would gain directly from providing the advice or information. We talk about opinion leaders. Um, we also talk about opinion leaders in, in um, uh, marketing one. And um, uh, you know, reputation is very important. Um, 
the experience with previous experience with the product uh, with for the person is also very important. Um, okay, so what is it that the opinion leader shares? What information does it share? They might talk about the best brands, the use of the brands, where to buy it, um, might be category specific. You're concerned about what the motivations are. So uh, you know, an opinion leader could be your hairdresser. It could be your physician. It could be um, you know, a lawyer. It could be your garage mechanic, that kind of thing. Those are people that are considered opinion leaders. Okay, so generally speaking, the, the opinion leader is knowledgeable about the product category. They should be relatively, they should be self-confident and outgoing. Um, read special interest publications and websites, you know, have some sort of, you know, research behind them. Um, oftentimes, the opinion leader has the same socioeconomic and age group as the receivers. So <clears throat> these are all things that you're, you're, that you're going to look for in terms of how much you trust the person. And marketers spend a lot of time trying to get in touch with those opinion leaders. Um, and, you know, they'll sell directly to them or do demonstrations and that kind of thing. Okay, so the next thing we're talking about is this idea of word of mouth. So um, word of mouth, uh, transmitting advice and other types of information about products, brands, and shopping experiences, usually peer-to-peer, -peer, or also it could be um, through this opinion leader. You know, you go get your hair cut and they tell you what shampoo to use or what conditioner to use or what types of, um, uh, you know, hairbrush or comb to use, that kind of thing. So word of mouth that takes place online is called EWAM. Um, also could be considered viral marketing. Viral marketing is a little bit different, but electronic word of, word of mouth is what happens in social networks. Um, uh, brand communities, blogs, chat rooms, tweets, that kind of thing. So, there's a variety of things that are going to influence um, consumers' uh, engagement in electronic word of mouth. The tie strength, that's the degree of intimacy and frequency of contacts between the information seeker and the source. Um, similarity among the group's members in terms of the demographics and lifestyles. We talked about that a little bit before. And then source credibility. Again, what is the level of credibility of the person providing the information? So um, social networks. Um, again, you know, so there are um, virtual communities where people share information. Uh, also type, type of electronic word of mouth. Um, brand communities are specialized, non-geographically bound communities formed on the basis of attachment to a product or a brand. So there are, you know, Harley Davidson users or, um, you know, people who, you know, drive Chevy trucks, that kind of thing. And then um, blogs and microblogs, uh, we talked about that before. So that's the idea of, you know, different posts online or also microblogs can be considered um, Twitter as a microblog. Okay, so how do we stimulate word of mouth? Viral marketing is one thing. We talked about that, um, you know, sharing something that, um, sharing videos or posts, that kind of thing, that one person shares it, then another person shares it, or one person shares it with someone and then with four people, and then those four people share it with four more people, and it moves on and on. Uh, what is the motivation for passing on the information? So is it... Um, uh, are you sending it to, is it a blind email, like, you know, a spam email? Are you sending it out to people you know? Um, that kind of thing. You know, why is it? Are they, is it, are they doing it for purely informative reasons? Or are they really doing it just to sell something to you? All right. And then there's this whole idea of a buzz agent. Um, so sometimes people will enlist typical consumers to serve as their buzz agent. It's that's a consumer who promotes products clandestinely, so, like, without people knowing. Um, or, you know, secretly, um, they generally receive some sort of pre product samples, but not any kind of monetary information. So um, why do you think it is that, this is something just for think about, why do consumers share negative rumors about companies and their products and services? Why is it that people are more often share negative things than positive things? Um, you know, I have my own opinion on that, but uh, I would be, you know, it's something for you to think about. I, I think generally people sort of like thinking about the negative more than they like thinking about the positive. 
because it's more interesting to talk about. It's sort of a, it's a, a uh, just kind of human nature. Okay, so get ready for a little blast from the past with, with, um, okay, I'm sorry. Well, we're going to talk about this. It's a little blast from the past for marketing one. You're going to see a chart in a minute that you should recognize. So we talk about diffusion of innovation um, and adapter categories as distinct marketing segments. So um, over time, we talked about negative word of mouth, but over time, positive word of the mouth, mouth leads to widespread adoption of products and that will fulfill some sort of need and um, that it works well. Uh, um, they're clearly differentiated and they provide some sort of value. So well, it takes, let's take a look at this. Okay, so there you remember the adapter categories from marketing one. So market, market, adapter categories is a classification system that um, depicts where consumers stand in relation to other consumers in terms of the first time they purchase an innovation. So when we look at that in terms of sociology, we talked about, we've talked about, you know, that it's um, consumer behavior is a multidisciplinary field and sociology is one of the ones that affects it. So sociologically, the model assumes that all members of a given society would eventually adopt the innovation. So the number of people belonging to each category was calculated in a manner to resemble some sort of statistical norm. Um, and then you see the norms that see it out there, how it works out that there's the, um, there's the, the innovators and um, the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and the laggards. Now, not every product makes it to even the early adopter stage, but it's just, it's still a framework that the marketers use to try to understand. So when, and we look on the one side is, is time and who the adopters are, and then on the um, left access is um, amount of people, but also if we talk about profits and number, it's increases sales are going to, of course, then also influence um, uh, uh, profits. So I want you to think about this in terms of, you know, the innovators are the people who are the first ones. They're the ones that are driving the Tesla, Tesla cars and the electric cars. They're the pe first ones to get an iPad, the first ones to have gotten an iPod years ago, the first ones to get laptops, the first people to buy, um, you know, ready-made um, meals at the grocery store. The, when a new product comes on, those are the innovators. And they're also considered the early adopter. They're also can, they also can be considered um, uh, opinion leaders. Okay, so let's just talk about um, innovators generally. So innovators first in the circles of friends to know what the latest hot designers are and emerging fashion trends. Um, they shop for new fashions more, more often than their friends do. They're the first ones to buy new outfits and fashions or styles or technology. They know more about what's going on. Um, if you're talking about, we're talking about fashion, but you can apply this to any category. Um, anyway, so you can, you can go read through that. They, um, uh, those are the people that these would, these would be the activities of the innovator when it comes to shopping. So that's something to, just something to think about. Okay. And then finally, and this whole idea of the adopter category is, is important. So, um, uh, the early adopter Consumers buy new products within a relatively short period following introduction, but not as early as the innovators. They're venturesome, they're likely to engage in word of mouth, and also likely to assist others who are considering adopting new products. So the early majority are consists of consumers who buy innovations after the early adopters. Um, they're larger than the preceding two groups combined, and at their risk averse. The risk aversion is defined as the reluctance to take risk and low tolerance of ambiguous situations. So uh, risk, you know, risk aversion increases as you go through that, that tablet of uh, uh, that, that chart. Um, late majority are risk averse and slow to adopt innovation. They wait until most other consumers have adopted a new product before buying it. And the laggards are the last consumers to adopt innovation. Um, by the time they get around to purchasing their first electronic reader, for example, the innovators and early adopters have already switched to more advanced models and laggards are generally high risk perceivers um, than the last and then last ones to recognize the value of innovative products. So marketers often write off non-adopters, but not all non-adopters are the same. And understanding non-users is important because one study found that two distinct segments among non-adopters of their internet banking, there's prospective adopters, 
um, who could potentially become customers and persistent non-adopters who are very unlikely to become it. So the study suggested that online banks should identify prospective customers among non-users rather than lump all non-users into a single category. Anyway, these are just all things to think about. Um, and uh, it's important because the question is who should marketers adopt, who should marketers um, speak to? Should they really be focusing on the innovators only or should they be looking at those that early majority and the early adopters? So er, innovators, who's more important, innovators and some of the early adopters or the majority of the early adopters and then some of the early majority. Okay, so that wraps it up for chapter nine. And um, again, thanks for listening and be in touch if I can help you.